Hey guys, welcome to the new campfire session of the interviews with the Haunting Masters, where we will be sharing those stories that have shaped us into the hunters that we are today. As an extra added bonus, once a month, I will be inviting one of you subscribers on the show to share your stories with us. Please let me know if you like this new addition to the podcast by leaving a comment on Podbean or a review on iTunes. Thank you. Now let's roll into the next episode. Hi, welcome to the interviews with Haunting Masters brought to you by the Sneak Tech Sneak Boot. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about elk hunting and elk calls, get a lot of questions about which calls to use, what's you know better for, suited for novice hunters, what is better suited for you know guys who've been doing it for a long time, uh, you know calls in different parts of the country, different situations. So uh, I reached out to Drew Rouse of uh, Real Game Calls, and uh, Drew, you know, puts out a pretty nice product, and um, we're gonna pick his brain a little bit today. What's going on, Drew? Oh, not much. Just been really busy with the production. I just got back from Utah yesterday. So out there chasing some deer around. Nice. So, yeah, it's pretty fun. What unit were you hunting? I'm hunting in the in the Oakers, west of Salt Lake. I got a friend who's got some property up there. Let me hunt. Oh, it. nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, I was just there cool myself. Deal, but man, it was awesome. I had a lot of fun. So. Yeah. Utah's a good place. Yeah. Oh, a good place to hunt anyway. <laughs> yeah, they got a lot of mule deer out there. I actually got to go elk hunting on Sunday. I had the I had the elk bugling. Uh, it didn't seem like they wanted to commit fully. Uh, it started getting real hot in the morning, and they just seemed like they wanted to go to bed. So. Yeah. Nice. Good deal. Um. Why don't you give us a little rundown about yourself and then uh, roll into some questions? Um, well, I'm originally from Maryland. I moved to Colorado in 1999 um, to be a skier. Um, I moved to the Vail Valley and I pretty much never left. Um, got into elk hunting. Uh, I missed, I grew up on the water fishing. So mm -hmm. got into bow hunting and elk hunting in the early 2000s and just fell in love right away. So um, felt my, fills my fall. Um, Turkey hunting in the spring, just really like being outdoors and, and fishing and hunting and stuff. So that's cool. Good deal. So skier turned hunter. I love it. Yep. Um, so I got a variety of questions from you. Some of them are uh, tactics related. Some of them are just kind of uh, call specific. Um, and I get this thrown at me a lot because there's a lot of guys that get cow tags out there and um, there's my retard dogs barking in the background. Um, a lot of us get cow tags out there and there's not a lot of people talking about how to harvest, you know, cows and tactics to harvest cows. So for those of us who have a cow tag, do you have any tips or tricks that you would uh, give us that uh, wanted yeah. to fill that? I call in a lot of cows. I, I shot a cow last year, second day of the season that I that I called in to like eight yards. Oh, We've wow. had some customers calling in in cow elk, and I think that uh, calling them is a good technique. I mean, they're kind of like like a school of bait fish, whereas mm -hmm. they feel safe safe in a high number of animals. The more animals there are, they usually want to be in those big groups because the odds of them surviving are better. That's right. my opinion. You know, right. bait fish wants to be in a big group. The cow elk want to be in a big group. And uh, you can call in whole groups of cows and call them in individually. Um, I think one of the reasons that people don't call for cows a lot is uh, some of those cows are older, you know, and they've they've seen, especially here, a lot more um, hunting pressure over the course of their life than oh, a bull yeah. that's only going to be like three and a half here in Colorado, you know. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So sounding sounding uh, um, really accurate is a real big big key. So if you're using a call that's not quite on, doesn't quite sound right, might not be the best technique to, to try and call it the older, more mature cow elk. So, what do you what do you typically what type of sound or what kind of vocalization are you typically using on that? I usually use like a calf talking to its mom. Like I'll do a bunch of high pitch stuff, and then I'll do you know like the assembly kind of mew, and then maybe get a little bit whiny at the end, like frustrated. But yeah, yeah, just trying to sound like a group of elk, really. Um, and keying on those cow vocalizations. Like I said, I think the cows are just really attracted to it, especially when you're doing calf stuff. You know, they, they hear the calves and the cows, and they, and they want to go be with them. So. Right, it's that maternal instinct. You, you're, yeah. I, mean, I think anytime you're, like, tapping into um, 
a powerful instinct like you know with the bulls you're talking about breeding and fighting and with cows you know you always go to that maternal because that's their strongest i feel like yeah. that's their strongest will they to have that herd men- they really have that herd mentality you know yeah um deer can be curious like that too but elk just really want to be in a big group elk so right yeah I, I feel like mule deer um fall prey to that too like i um I've had a lot of success uh, using fawn calls with mule deer. Sure. For yeah, sure. even especially, especially even in the like velvet fox. I stopped one the other day. <clears throat> we were, of course, in a unit. I didn't have a tag for a deer. I don't. I don't have an archery tag here in Colorado this year. But uh, we saw a deer up on top of this pass, and he kind of bolted. I just leaned out the window and played my doe bleat, and he stopped. And then he hung out there for like ten minutes within bow range. You know, mm. and probably like 185 inch deer just Ooh, standing there. Nice. <laughs> have a tag <laughs> of course that's yeah. how it always works out yeah so, but yeah i mean elk are really i mean they really want to be in the herd so another way I, that i'll hunt elk is like I, I do a lot of rifle hunts for elk and i'll use that call walking through the timber and, and calling really soft mm-hmm. you know and especially if you can get some snow on the ground and kind of figure out where they are then they'll let you walk up on them you know and if you're not calling, you might walk up on them and they're so keyed up to your walking that as soon as they see you and that they see you're not an elk, they're just gone. You know, mm-hmm. so when I'm rifle hunting, I'm just wanting them to stand there for like three more seconds, you know. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And get the get the gun up and there you go. So for sure. Cool. Um, so let's talk about the rut a little bit. During the rut, what um what would you say your three for a guy to learn, like what's the three must-have calls? What are the, what are the three sounds, the three vocalizations that you think a, a somebody needs to learn to be? Well, I mean, the, three specific rut? ones. You I mean there are so many different elk vocalizations. It would right. be hard. Just three, but you want to be able to to locate the elk bugling. So if you can yeah. get them to bugle, um, so a lot of times that really estrus, really loud cow call will get mm-hmm. them to answer back. <clears throat> Sorry, I thought I turned that off. Um, yeah, that really loud, really estrous, raspy cow talk call can get them to answer back when they won't answer anything else. Um, I do like a locator bugle with our, with our elk reel, where I just really try to get that really clear high note. I'm not really concentrate on like a really accurate elk vocalization, but just trying to get that really high, clear note that'll carry and, uh, see if they'll answer that back. Um, and then that cow calf conversation. I mean, I love to use that no matter what, because, mm-hmm. Generally, it's going to be the calves that are naive enough to talk. Mm-hmm. You know, the younger elk, you know, it takes them a little while to learn. I think that when they do talk during the hunting season, once they start getting bumped by people, that they'll, uh, they, they just don't realize it, that that's what they're doing is right. creating danger for themselves. And as they get older, they learn. I mean, cow elk are a pretty smart animal and bull elk, if you allow them to get to ma- age the same way. So I right. like to do half sound with the mom talking to it almost in all situations so cool yeah i I mean the reason why i chose i choose three and i always try to say that is because i feel like there's there's so many like you said out there and not everybody has the time to master them all and i feel like you're you're better you're better off if you can learn three calls and learn them really well do them really well and yeah. know when and where to use them, then let's say learn 10 calls and be half assed at them all, you know, just yeah, because if, if you're making bad sounds, I mean, you might as well just be quiet. Honestly, in my opinion, right. you can shoot yourself in the foot so fast and booger the elk. And I mean, if you're lucky enough to get on some animals that don't know they're being hunted, I mean, that's, you know, as soon as you mess it up for yourself, it just gets so much harder. So, right. Yeah. Um, especially true in Colorado. I, I I've hunted there and I, I noticed that, I mean, calls are they're yeah. very call shy, very call I saw, shy. I saw five hunters on opening day and I didn't see any elk. So if that tells you anything, like where we're <laughs> hunting, it's two hours west of Denver, you know, or three hours west of Denver, depending where we're going. I mean, there's a lot of people. So and there's yeah. a lot of trying to call elk and so many of them walking around bugling, you know, that uh, they're bugling before the elk are really bugling. And, yeah. Uh, them up so it's a yeah it's competitive out there so 
being able to accurately make a couple of vocalizations is way better than going out there and saying bad things. So you got you got one of your calls laying there. Yeah. So why don't you why don't you show us a couple of those three calls that you were what you were just yeah, so like a with. calf vocalization would just be like a really high pitch. kind of like that kind of noise, you know? Mm-hmm. And then when I would try and answer it back, some people would call this like an assembly mew. I just try and do like a longer, fuller cow note. And then if I do three in a row, then I'll try and whine at the end of it, so. You know, that kind of whine at the end of it. Right. So, yeah. Um, cool. And like, I could show you a locator bugle if you want. Sure, go ahead. Let me take my headphones off. <laughs> You know, and I'm really just wanting to get that long, clean note going with the with the call. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I'll use my tube about half the time. Um, last year, I started leaving it in the truck more and more. I mean, I just people ask me why we don't have these things on a lanyard. It's because I don't like stuff. Yeah. I mean, came up too. with this call because I really wanted something I could put in my pocket. And so, you can add a lanyard to it a whole bunch of different ways, but I would never carry it that way. So, and I hate yeah. carrying. I keep carrying the bugle. I mean, every time you turn around, it's halfway dangling down or, you know, I got to put it in my backpack and then pull it out all the time. So I just don't like a lot of stuff. I'm with you, man. I can't stand it. I I can't tell you, like it happened to me in California. I, I have like one of those like, um, retractable or not like retractable. It's kind of like a bungee lanyard for my range finder. And I got my freaking release caught on the damn thing. And I had a buck standing at 50 yards. And by the time I got on done, he was walking away slowly. And I, I was like, I wasn't going to put it up his ass. And I was like, you know, it's like, you know, and that's exactly the kind of crap that gets, that. I can't stand, I can't stand stuff. I like, I, I like to be shooting a four finger and then notice that that happens like almost every time. So I started wrapping my cord around my range finder before I put it back every time because yeah, that, yeah, I can see how that would happen. So Yeah, no. So, I mean, I've kind of messed with it a little bit now. So now I, I realize that th- it's happened to me twice that just kind of moved the position of it a little bit better. But, um, yeah, no, I was, you know. Yes. I, any, anything hanging you. from the neck, I can't yeah. take. It's just, no. Yeah. I, I even went to a different site this year. Last year, I had dove through some oak brush and bent my sight pin and, Man, I hate that kind of stuff, you know, where like it's just not optimal for actual hunting situation. Right. Yeah. Right. No, I agree. That's rough when stuff like especially when you work so hard to get to Yeah, you know, you know, <laughs> hike five miles, hike over a ridge, down the bottom, hike up another ridge, only to shoot an elk in the sternum because you bent your sight pinch. So that's literally what happened to me last year. I didn't get any blood, the arrow barely stuck in, fell out, and I was just like how did I shoot him at 12 yards in the sternum? <clears throat> but yeah, stuff like that happens when you're bow hunting. Like you said, you got your release and your right. brain wrapped up and it's just Murphy's law. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, for sure. So one of the main reasons why I reached out to you was I got a question. And it was, it's like super specific as I never really, I guess I never really thought about it. It's not that I haven't heard of it, but I haven't thought about it. I had a, a guy ask me for elk call recommendations for people who have like a sensitive gag reflex. Yeah. And I was like, well, there's, you know, there's tons of, you know, open read type calls and stuff like that. And that one, but I'm like, they don't really have that same diaphragm sound. Um, and I was like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to contact Drew. Cause I know your call obviously doesn't, it's, it's out of your mouth. It's not, you're not, it's not in your mouth. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about your call and the why it's set up the way it is? And I don't know. Well, it's a long story. I mean, <clears throat> I started making these things in 2012. And that first year, I called in just the biggest public land over-the-counter bull I've ever been close to. And I was at full draw twice on him. You know, he had heard my foot move when I drew, and he stopped behind a tree. And then finally, I was able to let down and thought he'd stand there for a minute. And then he started walking again. I had a draw. But the mm-hmm. call's in my pocket. So he's behind a tree, and I think I could have snuck the arrow by there, but I decided to wait and let him take a step. 
which I should have never done because when he took that step, he spun like a whitetail and I hit him so far back and I lost that bull and I couldn't stop him. And like, I've used my voice to try and stop elk in that situation and had him just run. So right, right. I was like, what do I got to do? I got to make it fit in your mouth. So we made it durable because the first calls were made out of foam and you could just crush them um, that you could <laughs> use it without your hands. And you can, right. it's small enough that you can put it far enough in your mouth that it won't interfere with your draw. So, you know, just being able to and never have a bad note when you're doing it. So you get the ultimate of reliability, a call that'll put the brakes on an elk right in your shooting lane. And then, you know, it's hands free. So you right. need both your hands or even if you're a gun hunter and you're trying to do that thing where, you know, where you're still hunting through the woods. And you want to shoot the elk? Well, you can stick in your mouth, pull your gun up, and, and cow call as you're shooting. So, right. you know, and you can do that with a diaphragm call. And there's a lot of people that are really good with them. I mean, I had a guy from Canada message me telling me how terrible our calls were yesterday. That he's the ma most amazing diaphragm guy, and that's well and good. Like, we probably don't need to sell you a call if you're an amazing caller and like, yeah, you yeah. don't need a, a new call then. You know, but don't buy one. <laughs> so, but you know, there's a lot of people that can't use a diaphragm, or they're just sick of buying diaphragms and replacing them all the time, or the fact that they fall apart. Or, most importantly, you know, like a lot of the elk outfitters that buy our calls, they don't want to make a bad sound. Right. And you got you got a client that spent seventeen thousand dollars on the tag to come hunt in Nevada, and you made a bad sound when his elk was in the shooting lane. Yeah. So that's the concern they express to me when they buy our call. They're like. Well, I want it because I don't worry about screwing up my client's hunt. hunt. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a or, lot of... Or this guy right here that's got a gag reflex, can't use a diaphragm. Yeah. You know, and he wants to be hands-free. Yeah, and you can provide something that, that you can't get with the open recall. And then, like I said, the reliability. Like, I'm not happy with a product that doesn't work 100% of the time. So yeah. we might not be 100,000% of the time, but I, I don't really get any bad notes you know so yeah. uh, a grass seed getting stuck in the call uh, that's happened to me a few times and i mean i don't know how i could design the call so that that wouldn't happen but no you know, that's all yours are gonna have something that could happen i suppose oh so, yeah for sure i mean even with the open reads i can't i have you know yeah. one of my favorite calls for using for a while was uh i think primos makes it it's called a cowgirl it's like sure. a, yeah you know, but I can't tell you how many times that, that thing freezes up like it, yeah. you know, and well, you we get, get a guy weird, weird sound uh, out of it. But when it works, it works great. You know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, like you said, I mean, how much effort does it take to get yourself in the situation where you're going to need that call to work at that time? Right. You know, exactly. Time, effort, you know, I mean, like people spend their whole year getting ready to be just for that one second where they can pull the trigger on their release and, and stick that herd bull or yep. cow elk or if that's, you know, your first elk on a four by four, you know, it means a lot to people. So. Yeah. yeah. But you started kind of rolling into my next, my next question was let's discuss the different types of calls that are out there and what are the pros and cons. Um, so let's just kind of elaborate on what we were just talking about really. I mean, uh, so there, you know, the, there's different open read calls, your double read, single read, there's different diaphragm calls, single read, double read, triple read, two, two and a half, one and a half, this, yeah. there's a whole bunch of different stuff out there. And it's kind of, what's your take I, on all that? Well, basically you have two designs that, that most people use, you know, with a third design being that push button call, um, that's really monotone, but mm -hmm. you know, the open read calls are all really similar. They all really have the same drawbacks. You know, they, they do make really good, loud cow vocalizations. You know, they can do that really raspy estrus stuff, um, but they stick. And, you know, it would be a lot of the times where you just blow it and it's just, eh, you know, instead of, of the smooth note. So they don't transition very good. And it's, you know, they were designed as a duck call by a guy named Halston in the 1930s with that, that ramp and that mylar okay. reed. So you're using the call that's nearly a hundred years old in design and while it'll work, you know, it wasn't, I found it wasn't perfect. I really liked a couple of different open reads that I used to carry and I carried three different ones for primarily, you know, for most of my elk hunting career. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't picked one up since 
2012. So. Nice. And then you got diaphragm calls, which, you know, a really skilled user can make really good vocalizations with them. So, you know, but under ideal circumstances, you're going to get that good note. And uh, the, I, I, I don't know. I probably kind of cause some controversy with some of my views because like I hear diaphragm guys in the woods mm-hmm. and I pretty much know they're diaphragm guys and I have to feel mm-hmm. like the elk kind of get the same impression, you know? So, yeah, I mean, yeah. not to toot our own horn, but I think our call sounds so accurate that it's really hard for the elk to distinguish. Is that an elk or is that a hunter? Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we went to try and hit, hit a home run with this thing where we want to make it sound perfect and then reliable so that i mean those diaphragms you can do really great full vocalizations with it and uh, we're coming out with a version of this at some point i have one that i use um i killed a whole bunch of turkeys in the spring prototyping it and uh i've been testing it on elk i was just in utah and called in a bull mm-hmm. right at dark on uh sunday and just he just didn't come out of his bed soon enough but they make really amazing bull vocalizations and there's no de- denying that um but they're not durable and uh, you know, ours will have a replaceable read and there's going to be some things about it that relate directly to this elk call. You know, the patents cover both designs. So cool. yeah, I mean, cool. diaphragm calls, there's a, there's some guys out there that love to bugle at bulls. I'm not one of them, but if you are, I mean, and you can use it and so be it, like, please hunt the way you want to, you know, like I try to tell people, like, I just right, think right. if you're cow calling with them, that, that it, it has a really unique latexy sound and you know there's some really really good guys with it and then there's the rest of us so, right yeah. but, well i mean for me i just think it's it's another tool to add to the tool bag you know it's like okay. i mean yeah can i can i use a small phillips head screwdriver to to, to you know to, to open up this big phillips head screw i mean you know yeah you can but you're gonna have a hard time you're gonna have to work yeah. at it you know and i just feel like every situation has has its purpose and i think you know you kind of you can't you can't satisfy everybody and cover everything especially no. with one with one call yeah. and you've done a good job of kind of um covering a lot you you covered a broad spectrum with one call and that's not many people can ask more more of that and i, I mean i uh, yeah. i played around a little bit with your call um last year uh, and, and I lost it and I don't have it anymore, but um, I'm going to have to pick myself up another one before I leave for my elk hunt here in a week. But um, yeah, I think it's just a, it's a neat sound and call. I, I think it, you got a good, uh, good idea behind it. And the fact that it's hands free and, and, and has the ease of use of a, you know, um, an open read. I mean, you can't ask for more than that. Yeah, no, I mean, it does a good job. And like you said, it's a tool. You know, and sometimes you might be better off sitting on water and not calling at all. So, yeah. you know, what's your what's your end goal? You want to shoot an elk. So, yeah. you know, and there's a lot of a lot of stuff that I have in my backpack that tries to you know, help me. I carry a couple decoys and you know tools that help us get an elk to walk over at 40 yards and stand there broadside. So, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, cool, man. So I kind of always um, I like to end my. Uh, podcast with uh you sharing a story with us that i don't know maybe maybe one of your most memorable hunts or maybe it was you know a hunt that had a teaching moment for you or something where you realized something about you know elk hunting or deer hunting something that kind of just put you know put something in perspective for you or changed the way you hunt now huh um yeah i I would say my knee, I mean, like I've had six knee surgeries, so it's caused me to hunt and walk a lot slower and really be more patient going through the woods, you know, where I, when I was younger and then I've had four ACL reconstructions and a microfracture surgery. So Freaking I definitely skiers. can't cover the amount of terrain that I did when I, when I was younger, but I think that's benefited my hunting styles that I've gotten more patient, you know, uh-huh. I've, I've learned to like, you know, maybe not call as much or make sure that when I'm calling that I have a really good goal in my mind because I don't want to go and booger the elk out of my spot that's closer to the road. Next thing I know, I got to chase him five miles back in the mountains. So right. just be patient and, uh, you know, learning to, to walk slower 
and uh, listen more, you know, and try and not mess up your hunt. You might see less animals, but most of the time when you're running around in the mountains, calling and, and trying to cover ground, well, you're going to see those animals and they're going to be going that way. Yeah. So I'm not to bump them and just be more patient as I get older. So, yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, man, I want to thank you for coming on. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, you know, good luck to you on the rest of your season. You got any, got any good tags that you uh, drew this year or any really special? I'm going home with my friend Clayton. Uh, he's a young guy. He's an outfitter in Kansas. He's just getting started. Um, but I'm going to hunt whitetails with him in, uh, nice. in one Northwest Kansas. And, uh, I got bit by the whitetail bug pretty bad last year. Um, we make this doe bleed. It's really easy to use, you know, just, but I had to go test it on whitetail. So I spent, uh, like five weeks hunting whitetails last year. I missed two of them with my bow, but we, you know, we took 12 calls of Wisconsin. We shot a giant. So I kind of can't wait to go back out and try and get some redemption on those whitetails. So, yeah. They get underneath your skin, man. A lot of guys that I talk to don't understand. Like, cause oh. I mean, I'm primarily a Western hunter, but I grew up sure. in the East coast hunting whitetail. And, um, and every year I always make at least one, if not two trips a year to go hunt whitetail. And like people are like, Oh, but you sit in a tree stand and you, you're, you know, you're blind. But it's like, you don't get it. I it's mean, it's variety and it's something it, new. I mean, like, yeah, I don't know if you see that buck right there, but I shot him with my bow. I haven't shot a muley with my bow since then. It kind of messed me up. Yeah. I go shoot 130 inch whitetail around. Now I'm all excited again. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, That's a stud back, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, and it's like, this is an animal that lives in and amongst these his predators, and, and it's, it's more of a chess match. I mean, mule deer hunting's amazing. I love it. You know, spot and stalk, or I yeah. mean, even I'm gonna go back to the Wasatch in, in December and try to call some in with my friend uh, Mike. And he's always calling these, calling the does in and pulling a big buck in behind them. So I want to go yep. try that. So that's how I like to hunt them. Yeah, that's my yeah. that's my gig. So no, that's cool, man. Um, well, good luck to you. I hope uh, you have a good right. rest of the season, and uh, we'll talk yeah, soon. Yeah, you as well. I appreciate you having us, having me on and uh, taking the time to, to hear about our, our, our calls. Yeah, so. for sure. Take Thanks, Sean. Have a good one. Bye.